Hello. I'm uh, just pumping down the SCM right now. So it will be a minute or two. Be patient. Hey, Astro Canuck, how's it going? I see you're, uh, you're back in Canada. I caught a little bit of your stream. Uh, I think it must have been yesterday. Saw you in your, uh, your Leafs jersey and uh, all your Canada paraphernalia behind you. Uh, are the telescopes set up now? Or are you still getting things set up? Oh, oh, your telescopes are still crossing the Atlantic. Oh, that must be, I don't know, com kind of traumatizing to have all your equipment out there. Is it, it's being crated, right? It's being shipped across on an actual boat. Is it too big? I don't know, if somebody had my camera equipment, I'd be like, yikes. Okay, well, at least it's professional. It's a good way to handle it, I guess. Ah, we already got it. Good. I haven't been in my uh, lab for a week now. So... Hopefully everything still works. Looks like it does. Uh, I got some of these samples from Pacific Plankton and some of them from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, graduate PhD students, I'm on, I'm on their committee and they just wanted me to check out some of their, uh, some of their stephanodiscus in here. Um, and see what I thought they were. So, I've been good. I was home for uh, visiting my family for the last week. Had a birthday and uh, got to hang out with them for a while. I hadn't seen them since uh, like Christmas a year and a half ago because uh, of COVID. But um, at least we're all on track now or mostly on track. So, um, so that part's good. These are samples from um, Jackson Lake, uh, a lake near um, Grand Tetons National Park. And um, the student who's analyzing these his name is John. He uh, took a diatom class with me as a remote student in the fall last year. And hopefully he's trained enough uh, that he'll be able to analyze these samples. But I uh, had something he wasn't sure if it was Stephanodiscus or Cyclostephanos and wanted me to take a peek at it. And I'm not sure if those are in this sample or I think it's actually this sample six that had them in it. and see what we can find. 
and then I have some material. Uh, hey Sam, how's it going? Um, I have some material from Pacific Plankton as well. So how long does it take from uh, from the SCM to be ready for imaging once it's switched on? Um, let's see, at the start of the stream, I had, uh, I had just loaded the samples in. So I had to turn it in and vent it and then put the samples in and then pump down. On my SCM, that takes um, maybe two minutes. Um, and then once the sample is pumped down, um, it takes me a little while to basically, you know, get the image looking good. I have to tweak things. Uh, still not happy with how this one looks quite yet, but it's looking better. So I'm going to, let's see, let's... I think that's a Stephanodiscus. Um, let's do some, a little bit of work to try to get these images looking better. Not sure what that, it's got a weird hole in the middle of it. Oh, I think maybe that's a ring least. That's a Olicocyra. Oh, it's kind of big. So yeah, once you have, I mean, I can get to the point where I have an image pretty quickly, like within a couple of minutes, but um, then there's usually this sort of calibrating and monkeying around with getting the quality of the image better. And that probably usually takes me, I don't know, well, you're going to sit through it, I guess, so maybe five minutes or so. Um, can't take longer sometimes. First thing I usually do is this, which is uh, trying to get the wobble in good condition. It seems like it's mostly there. So I don't think that's an issue, uh, but I'm going to just a little to make sure. Like it seems like it's in a good place. It's a slight... Just be a little patient, and I'm going to work on, actually, I think the next step I need to do probably could be done on an inside of a valve a little bit better than the outside of a valve. These are great for this. So that's a... Uh, 
um, about face photoportula, or what we sometimes refer to as a strutted process. It's on the inside of a diatom. And then these little guys right here, these little bumps are, these little white specks are cribra. And the conditions are optimal with respect to this focus and the stigmation. slow the beam down, those normally stand out as little sort of salt and pepper shaker heads. You can kind of start to see it there. Uh, it's telling me I need to adjust my gun heating, which is probably why we're not seeing it clearly. Um, is it all manual focus or automatic? Um, the SCM has an option for autofocus, but the problem is it doesn't know what you want to focus on. So, you know, there's a lot of three-dimensional structure. Hey, Marmot. Um, so it will get it kind of close if you do the autofocus, but um, really only like, um, like in bulk, like it'll get it, like if you don't have any kind of focus, if everything's out of focus, it'll get it to the point where you can see things. Um, and then after that, it's, you know, picking the thing you want to focus on and, um, and then doing it manually. So the first thing I did was make some adjustments to the wobble. And the second thing I did was make some, um, adjustments to, uh, the stigmation. So just like putting glasses on a person that's got, uh, astigmatism, um, it basically puts glasses on the SEM using the magnets and rearranging it so that the beam is focused directly on the surface. And the better your um, stigmation is, the better your image is. So um, it's usually where a lot of my effort goes when I'm trying to get things in focus perfectly. Um, right now the instrument's um, telling me it needed to make some adjustments to the gun heating, which is, um, the electron gun in the top and um, the reason it needs to do that is oftentimes when you start up the filament um, you have to make some adjustments to um, to get it the electron cloud Functioning, functioning appropriately. And so normally what I do is um, it's like uh, whatever it did, it's taken the And centering needs to be done. Um, can you see DNA? Eh, not really. Um, for a number of reasons. Anyway, so normally I do a um, gun heating to get the temperature of the filament to the right temperature. Because if it's doing, if it's generating too many electrons, if it's too hot, basically, um, it's too bright. Uh, it's just wasting the filament. And if it's too low, then you're probably just not getting enough um, electrons. So the, um, the filament is basically just a piece of metal between two posts and, uh, and it runs electricity through, but also heats it. And the heating is basically the sort of finer adjustment um, that it makes. And uh, together those two things basically um, 
get you sort of in an ideal setting for your combination of temperature and voltage. And um, so it's doing that, right? Well, it was doing that. Now it's doing um, automatic gun centering, which usually has to be done after the filament's been um, adjusted for heating. So uh, to get to your question, Sam, um, there's a couple of reasons why you can't really see DNA with an SCM. Uh, well, not with this one anyway. Um, one, um, living material usually doesn't do very well, like organic material, um, in a vacuum. And so um, that's probably the bigger issue at stake, is that um, everything's taking place in a vacuum. Um, but also DNA is a little bit smaller than you would typically be able to see easily on an instrument like this. So. I'm now making some adjustments to the, uh, just the brightness so we don't have this like extremely bright image. And next thing I'm going to work on is going back to see if the wobble got messed up by the um, sort of starting over the process that we just did. Um, which it looks fine. Um, but the stigmation probably needs adjustment as well again. For some reason, my image has been worse since it did its auto gun heating, so I feel like maybe it messed it up. I'm going to try it again. So, uh, has everybody's 4th of July weekend been for people in the U.S.? Um, I went out and did some photography last night, uh, imaging the fireworks, and I got some really nice shots of the fireworks um, from here in Indiana. Um, people love fireworks here and they love setting up their own fireworks here. So, so I think there were fireworks going off until one or two in the morning. And probably if they didn't set them off, uh, if they didn't get them all set off yesterday, they'll probably set off some more tonight, um, which is pretty typical for our uh, experience with respect to Fourth of July weekends here.
So we're mostly looking at uh, diatoms in these samples. Um, this is Lindavia intermedia. Uh, I think that's actually a chrysophyte right there, a really large one. Um, and then chrysophyte stomatocyst. And then this one here is Asterionella formosa, which is a, um, it's just a, it's a colonial diatom. They make a star shape. That's where it gets its name, Asterionella. And um, they connect by this central, uh, by this bigger head pole, which is actually a foot pole in this one, for some reason. Um, and then they radiate out from that in a star shape star pattern and um, this is kind of nice because this is an external view of this diatom this is the inside of it this is the outside of it and um, you can't see that sort of thing in the light microscope but in the scanning electron microscope it's pretty obvious um, the outside doesn't have a lot of the same um, access to the, uh, the processes that you would see in the internal view, and um, so everything in our field of view right now is about 50 microns. That's our field of view is like 56 microns, um, or a magnification of about um, 5,000 times. And if I zoomed in so that this diatom, this this Lindavia intermedia, as I mentioned. Um, is sort of in the center of our field of view um, such that it's taking up the entire image. This is about uh, 10,000 times magnification right there. And so you can see all kinds of detail you wouldn't normally be able to see. Um, also, you'll note down here there's a little bit of a white area around the, um, the valve like in here where it's lighter and it's darker around here. It's because the actual, the um, electron beam is actually going all the way through uh, the diatom skeleton right here, the cell wall. And you're seeing this thing behind it, which is a piece of silt. Um, you're actually seeing through the diatom. It's lightly enough silicified and the beam is um, set to a 30 kilovolt uh, accelerator voltage actually sort of seeing through the diatom a little bit, um, which is cool, except for when you don't want to see it through it, I guess. Um, there's another, either a microsphere or a, uh, a chrysophyte cyst, and here's a little tiny stuff in a discus, um, probably belongs to uh, rugosa or something like that. Um, these little tiny slit-shaped uh, openings and then um, a spine at the end of every one of the costi. So I'm zooming out, obviously, right now. Um, there's another internal view of the Lindavia. This is a girdle view or side view of an Olicocyra. These are all different types of diatoms. Um, and what I'm looking for, that's a girdle band. Um, that's an internal view. Nope, that's a girdle band. There's nothing on the inside. Uh, it's probably one of these little guys. These little tiny stuffs. That is right here. And really, we're just trying to see what kind of stuffs we have. That does not look like a, um, well, that just looks like Stefan Discus to me. Minutula slash parvula, parvus. Um, but we're looking for something that the student thought was potentially Cyclostephanos. So it's going to be one of these round guys. Oh, 
probably in the range of this one. Lots of stuff in the discus. Pretty sure that's just a Stephanodiscus. Um, hey, Pantene, how's it going? We're looking through some samples from Jackson Lake uh, right now, and then I've got some additional sample material from Pacific Plankton that had sent me from uh, uh, San Francisco Bay. see what we can do about. Let's find an internal view of one of these big guys. Oh, that's a chrysophyte. There's a bunch of really big chrysophyte cysts in here. And those are 15 micron. Pretty big. At least for what we usually see. This is just Stephanodiscus. Uh, it does not look like a Cyclostephanos to me. The same thing over here. Like everything we have on here is just a plain Stephanodiscus. This is Lindavia Intermedia again. Just wanted to come in here and see if I can Tweak my settings enough to see some of the structure a little better. These look pretty clean. So I'm just going to work on tweaking my stigmation just a little bit more. Um, when you're in this close, you usually have to change the beam intensity too, because um, the beam becomes a little too wide. You can see how that improved the image quite a bit, um, especially in here. I'm going to Let's see if I can get that image a little bit cleaner. And what I'm looking for is just some sharpness in here. You should be able to start to see that um, salt and pepper shaker heads now. Um, that's basically how I can usually gauge that the um, stigmation is in a good place. Now I can zoom back out. Um, once you have it set, then you don't usually need to monkey with it too much, so I just wanted to um, try to get it where I need it. Uh, it's no SEM last week, Prague. Uh, 
uh, this week I do have the SCM. I'm back in the lab. Um, I'm home from visiting family. So, we do have some SEM again, which is nice. Nice for uh, a little afternoon stream. And then I also spent the day in the lab earlier prepping some materials from the pond at my mom's house. So we should have some slides today or tomorrow from that as well. Um, and then uh, possibly Wednesday or sometime this week, I may do a little SEM stream of the materials from my mom's and her neighbor's ponds. Um, I need to first see them in the light microscope and sort of see how they look. It's a cool diatom. This is Lindavia ocellata. Um, it's characterized by having these um, elevations. So there's like depressions here, three, three depressions and three elevations um, that are next to them. And um, it's nice and it's mostly clean. There's a little bit of clay up here, but the, um, the surface is mostly clean. So just thought I would stop and try to get the make sure that everything's looking good in the actual picture taking uh, process. Um, but it's characterized by those depressions. There may be as many as six or seven or eight in some of them. And then um, this is pretty characteristic of the stria. Usually they're multi seriate So this is in rows of three, basically through most of it. These little dots that are all over the surface are called granules. And then um, these are the uh, external expression of the strutted processes that we were seeing when we saw the inside of the valve. And somewhere there's a, there should be a external expression of the remoportula as well. Uh, it'll be on a costi like this that's thickened typically. And maybe somewhere in here or a little closer towards the center. Could potentially be that, but I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. I think the image is going to be okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and collect that. Oh, Acellus, thank you for the raid. Uh, I peeked in on your stream a little bit earlier. Um, Coach Shipley also, hello. <laughs> you wish you understood even a quarter of this. Ask questions. Um, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, Rams Reef also raided. I got two raids. Uh, and I was busy chatting and missed both of them. Um, let's see. I should give a shout out to Rams Reef. And also, uh, Astro Canuck was in here earlier. Um, may still be here. You should check them out. And, um, Acellus, yeah, I, I just peeked in on your, uh, on your, uh, backyard bird stream. I didn't see any birds, um, but it was slightly, um, before I started getting stuff ready for the SEM. Um, if you haven't seen a cellus, yeah, it was raining, yeah, uh, totally. Uh, sometimes when it's raining, I get more birds in my feeders. Um, uh, but a cellus is streams from Scotland, I think it is, uh, from their, their backyard, often birds. Um, I've also seen them do some, uh, some VR, uh, streams where they 
uh, uh, use the oculus to chop up um, little squares to music and actually um, my daughter wants one of those so we just bought it uh, an oculus um, hasn't arrived yet uh, but I, I really I played that game that you play all the time on there and uh, and I thought it was kind of fun so I don't know that I'll do a stream from it but um, you know it looked like a pretty cool system yeah very cool uh, so right now we're just looking at some material from Jackson Lake um, which is near the Grand Tetons and uh, this isn't what the student asked me to look at. They sent me some stuff and said, could I check to make sure that uh, what they were seeing was Stephanodiscus, uh, or whether it was Stephanodiscus or Cy Cyclostephanus dubius. And uh, I've only seen Stephanodiscus so far, so I think maybe what they were seeing was a Steph. I'm going to take these slides and also make some, uh, these st samples and also make some light microscope um, samples from them so I can check them out in the light microscope and take some pictures and make sure that I'm seeing what uh, what they thought I was seeing or what I should see. Um, these are Jackson Lake. Sorry, I need to put these somewhere. Good. Last week I was in Ohio for the whole week, visiting my family, and um, and so I didn't even, I only streamed some bird stuff and uh, and a little bit of, of photography. We did some night photography with my sister, and um, I think we had Oh no, I think there was a storm, but I didn't stream it. I just imaged it. I never really did get any... Uh... Streams to uh, storms that I could stream, so... This is just a little stuff as well. So the difference between Stephanodiscus and Cyclostephanus is they typically have sort of a chamber around the outside and also um, uh, the costi, which are a little bit more visible um, typically in Cyclostephanus, run all the way to the edge, but I don't even see costi on this one. So I think it's just a plain old stuff. Can at least image it. It's pretty flat, so I'm not sure about the species. Uh, night animals or night stars? Um, <laughs> yeah, we have some pretty impressive storms uh, here, and I had some really great uh, lightning from my mom's house that I got imaged of. Um, the night photography we were doing, we were just looking at stars um, with my sister. So, uh, she did a sort of a long exposure uh, star trails thing and um, was talking about how you could do that. And um, I was just collecting images of stars over my mom's house and, um, and uh, trying to get the best Milky Way images I could get, which weren't great, um, to be honest, relative to things you can typically see in the Western US. Um, but uh, pretty nice for just a camera stream and doing some night photography. And then um, I think I did a couple of bird streams with my mom's birds, which are different than the ones that we have here. Um, she gets orioles on her feeder and blackbirds, which I don't get here. And um, we saw a red-eyed vireo. It wasn't really on the feeder, but it was next to it. Uh, 
Uh, she gets a lot of different birds than I got, so. But, uh, it's nice, calm, very chill. Oh, you're an astronomer. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, I guess I've seen you stream some stuff from a telescope before. Um, I'm not an astronomer, so. But uh, I think we were hoping to get some Uh, Andromeda photos, but it was below the horizon, and I didn't have my, um, uh, Star Trekking base on at all, so, but if we could have found something cool, I probably would have, anyway. Um, not really seeing the, uh, Cyclostephanos at all yet. It's just an internal view of a little stuff. Also, it's sort of charged up a little bit, which is weird. And I think that one that we were looking at, that was the internal view, and I think this is its external view. Whatever it this is, I think it's Rugosa, maybe, or something kind of related to it. But I think this is probably the external view of that diatom. basically looking the wrong way through a telescope at small things. Yes. Uh, I, I like to take anything small and make it big. So if I have to um, use a telescope to make small stars look big, uh, which, I mean, they're much bigger, obviously, in reality, uh, I will, uh, or my camera to do the same thing, um, or I look at really small things in a microscope, uh, or I do like macro photography, anything that appears small, whether it's actually small or not, uh, I kind of like to, to image, um, the invisible basically, or the barely visible. So. Uh, oftentimes though, it's very alien landscape that we look into in lakes and ponds and streams and anything else um, that's tiny. Um, in the evenings often I'll look at stuff in the light microscope and uh, living organisms are a little bit more common uh, as my focus. People are a lot, typically a lot more interested in seeing stuff wiggle around. Um, than getting into the details of uh, sort of things we can see in the scanning electron microscope. But, uh, I'm doing this anyway, so I figure I could might as well stream it. Everybody's gone here today. There's nobody in the lab uh, except for me, and then I don't think there's anybody in the university except for me. <laughs> I've seen my, my wife came in for a little bit uh, to join me in the lab. And I have not seen another single person or vehicle other than somebody running around the outside of campus when I came in. Um, because it's the Monday after the 4th of July here, yeah. And so uh, there's zero people around, um, which is honestly the way I like campus the best. Uh, it's quiet, I can get work done, and... Um, I like the students in my lab, don't get me wrong, but uh, 
I also like just being able to work in, in peace in my lab and get, get a bunch of things done. So I prepped a whole bunch of samples for the SCM and for the light microscope today. And um, so it's working out. Not seeing a lot of what they wanted me to see. Um, so far, anyway. Uh, everything in here is a Steph or a Lindavia or an Oligocyra, in my opinion. That's a Lindavia, that's a Stephanodiscus, Stephanodiscus. Alakasira. All right. Um, why don't we? I'll image this just in case this is the thing they think is dubious. I honestly think that's just dummy neutralist, though. Uh, and then we'll jump over and look at some of the stuff that we got from... <laughs> I like the students in the lab, but it's better when they're not here. Uh, I get more work done when they're not here. Yeah. Uh, Pantene, I liked working in the evening, night at campus. Um, I wouldn't mind working at night, except for... Uh, I've got a daughter, and uh, she's seven, and I don't get to see her much if I work during the day. And if I'm there all night, basically, I would, would miss my family. So um, I suppose I could come in late at night and then just work during the day. Um, the problem with that is my students also need me to be around to answer questions and to help them with things. And so, um, you know, I can't spend the whole day in the lab. So, but it wouldn't be terrible to do the reverse occasionally. Where I'm not around during the day, but I come in in the evenings. Um, just because I like to be able to work in peace. So. When I was a PhD student, I would work, I would get my lab work done from I'd work best from sort of 11 o'clock until in the after in the morning until about three o'clock in the afternoon, and so I was really productive in that little window, and then after three I would just sort of get burned out being on the microscope or or doing lab work, and um, and so then I would just kind of relax or do other things or hang out, you know, uh, with friends or whatever until about 11 o'clock at night, and then from 11 o'clock at night until about three in the morning. Again, I was super productive. So I would spend that time doing my homework and writing papers and working on publications or research or whatever. And so I would do like a 11 to three and 11 to three, like twice a day, I'd be really productive. Um, and then I would just, you know, sleep between them and whatever else. Um, but I found like I worked best when I was sort of in that zone between 11 and 3, whether it was in the morning or the evening. Um, but one of the things I really like about my job is that, uh, especially in the summer when I'm not in class, um, really I have the capacity to kind of just work whenever I need to. Um, so 
it's very flexible. And even during the semester, sometimes it's pretty flexible. So. Okay. Uh, I don't think that's a cyclostuff phanos at all. I think it's a stuff. So. But I'm going to send some pictures back to John and see what he thinks and see if that was the thing he was looking at or whether he had something else in mind. Let's take a look at some of the material that Pacific Plankton sent me. So this is some material that's, I think this is the unprocessed version of um, some samples that she sent me from uh, San Francisco Bay. She'll be disappointed she wasn't here to see it. Oh wait, maybe this is uh, Mountain Lake. This doesn't look like San Francisco Bay. Oh wait, take it back. That's definitely San Francisco Bay. It's definitely a marine diatom. Yeah, so I think this is some of the living material from, from San Francisco Bay bunch of them, marine stuff. There's a tintinid. That sorts it. This is the skeleton of a tintinid. Uh, they have these sort of light ball shaped skeletons and the organism kind of lives inside of there. They make their homes out of material that they find and they kind of glue it together. And in the unprocessed samples, we can find them Sometimes they've got bits and pieces of diatoms stuck in there. Um, so that's sort of one of the reasons there's another one. So there's one that's a diatom. There's another one right there. Uh, Why well, sometimes I'll prep these samples and then not process them. We just rinse them to get the salts out of them basically. Um, so that we can see things that basically would uh, fall apart if we put it into nitric acid and um, so it gives us a different sort of view of the materials that are there and what kind of organisms are there um, in it. See there's a lot of junk in this sample as well. This is a Cassinodiscus, one that we commonly see um, in these San Francisco Bay samples. I think this is a Glassosyra. Oh, no, also a Cassinodiscus. Uh, you can see there's something that was living back here behind it. So the live samples for the, these um, are kind of nice because they um, allow us to see diatoms living in colonies, like this one, um, and also lightly silicified things or things that would dissolve very easily. So uh, this is an example you can kind of see. This was connected to that at one point. You can sort of see the colony right here and it continues all the way up through there. So you can see this is like a piece of a long colony of diatoms. Just one aspect of it. Um, but also there's a bunch of tintinids. There's one, there's one. Uh, that's a piece of poop. That's uh, something fish or some other poopapod or something has eaten and pooped it out. Um, there's a Thalassia syra. You can see uh, this one big rimoportula with a tube sticking off of it, which is typical for Thalassia syra. Um, there's some advantages and disadvantages, though. The disadvantage would be that uh, the organic matter can sometimes create problems for us to see things in the skeleton. And so sometimes it's um, a good idea to have a little bit of both. 
and there's a giant ismia that looks gorgeous actually um, like the little emote that we have um, on the surface of these sometimes in these pores and they're perfectly in focus. Um, I think the pores on these things measured something like two microns across. This diatom is really huge. And yeah, so there's a pore. One of the pores on these things are basically in some cases four, four microns, three to four microns across. And there's some diatoms that, you know, that's their total size. <laughs> their total size is like three to four microns. So um, just to give you a sense of how big these things are relative to everything else on the screen, um, sort of a mothership diatom. Um, the field of view right there is 394 microns. So that thing's almost 400 microns across. Um, like almost a half of a millimeter such that you could see it uh, probably pretty easily in a sample wouldn't be able to pick it up still here's a tintinid and that's a piece of it that's a diatom uh, frustrable a bit of diatom that it's welded into it's or glued into its um, its skeleton There's an arachnidiscus, and I think part of the reason that uh, Pacific Plankton sent me these samples is because we were looking to see if we could find some arachnidiscus in the SEM, and uh, I think the sample actually had kind of a lot of arachnidiscus in it. Um, so hopefully one of those with a little bit of a clearer view is going to be available on one of the other slides or stubs that I made. See all of the sort of magical little pores. There's a rim portula between each of them. Let's see, I'm going to jump this up to 10. And then Plasticyra. Um, in the light microscope versions of these that I was looking around in, I saw some really cool big colonies as well. Not really seeing those here. Um, that could be in part because of the amount of other material on the slide. Ooh. Big charge. That thing's up off of the surface. I think those are Ellerbeckia stacks. <laughs> Goliathom, yeah, it's huge. Uh, in a single cell as well. We talk about this pretty regularly on Pacific Plankton Stream how you can have something that's 300, almost 400 microns across, and it's a single cell. And then, you know, swimming next to it, something smaller that's a multicellular <laughs> organism. Um, that's kind of a neat aspect of looking at things that are this tiny, is that some of these things are monstrous, but just one cell, and some of these things are tiny but multicellular so um, I'm always hoping when I go through these samples that I find some 
dinoflagellates where you could see the plates very easily, but we almost never see them. And I think it's because they just degrade pretty rapidly or um, you can see this tintinids everywhere. Uh, or they're here and they just shrivel up when, uh, when they get in a vacuum. Like structurally, they're not stable enough to actually image without making some adjustments to them. I'm not sure which it is. It could just also be they're rare. Or get clumped up when we start looking at them in the SCM. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Winner, will sometimes put them samples that have been filtered um, through filter paper on the SCM. And they'll see a bunch of really beautiful dinoflagellates that way. So it could be there's just a lot of junk around them that needs to be pulled off. I've seen a lot of tintinates though in these samples. Let's jump over and look at some of the processed material from the same sample. I think this is processed. Maybe I have a couple live samples. Maybe it's another living one. Still some tintinates together. There's an arachnidiscus right there. Sometimes they're a lot bigger than this, but... It's a diatom like a Colosseum. Um, it has that name arachnidiscus because the costi, which are these sort of heavier, brighter lines you see right here, um, have sort of a uh, radiating structure and then like things that go across them to make them kind of look like a spider web. And so people thought that they looked kind of like a spider, spider web. And uh, that's what gets the name arachno, like a spider. We've been looking for them uh, in the SCM for a long time now because we'd see them very rarely in the light microscope samples when um, Pacific Plankton would send them to me or she'd see them in her light microscope samples while they were still alive. And then uh, we just never really managed to get more than just a piece of one in the SCM before now. So this is nice. An ostrich egg is one cell too. Um, is that true? I don't, I mean, it starts off as one cell, but I think it, it's very rapidly divides. So probably not by the time you see it, it's not. But I'm not an expert in ostrich eggs, so.
Oh, a Celis raided us and then he went back into streaming again. I guess he was just resetting. <laughs> he did clip it. Yeah, right. Uh, I'd have to Google it, I'm afraid. I don't know the answer. It's a pretty quiet Twitch day. I'm assuming everybody's outside enjoying the weather here in the U.S. You <laughs> forgot to stop. Okay. <laughs> You're still streaming. Just for one person. Okay. I'm not critiquing. If you want to go back to streaming, you can. Let's see if we can find one that's not in the shadow of another giant piece of junk. Uh, but at least we know what we're looking for now, right? Got this sort of wheel in the center and then this sort of spoke-shaped uh, structures. Really like to see the internal view of one as well. Pacific would probably enjoy it. She's probably going to be mad that we uh, found one and she wasn't here. These are... Is this Kobay? Uh, these are from June 15. And that is... Arachnodiscus external. structure of something. Not sure what that was. Oh, here's one. Right here. There's an internal view of one of them. It's not particularly clean. It's got a lot of junk on it. But, that is the internal view of that thing we just saw from the outside. So again, it has sort of a wagon wheel in the center, it has these spokes coming out from the middle, and um, just for scale, the diatoms that we were looking at last time on the Jackson Lake, like earlier on the other stub, uh, they were usually ranging from somewhere around 5 to 30, maybe 40 microns. So this one's 160 across. So um, marine stuff is really big compared to freshwater stuff pretty commonly. All the stuff that's trapped in here is probably clay or organic matter that didn't degrade when we processed it. More likely it's probably clay. It's probably detrital clay.
Looks good. Hopefully it stays that way through the whole picture. I'm continuously awestruck by the beauty and structure of diatoms. Yeah. You're rather nonchalant about them, though. Is it because you've been exposed to so many? Uh, no, that's my... Um, uh, I am actually awestruck by them all the time. Um, uh, that's my awestruck voice, uh, really, honestly. Um, I've never seen this particular diatom in the scanning electron microscope before. Hey, mind of a snail. How you doing? Snail. Um, I mean, honestly, they're always amazing to me. I just, uh... I'm pretty laid back, I guess. My response is usually pretty laid back <laughs> about everything. Uh, out of habit. But, um, no. I, um, I'm nonchalant only in the sense that um, I'm, I guess, I'm always excited by what I'm finding. I could do this for literally an entire day and still be like, cool. Um, uh, all the way through. I never get tired of looking at diatoms. So, I'm sort of a... Um, stoic personality, generally speaking. Usually the best you get out of me is like a, whoa. <laughs> cool as a cucumber. <laughs> Hello, Bill Nash. How are you doing? Uh, somewhere. Uh-huh. Ah? Uh? I told you I'd do it eventually. Um, you survived the weekend intact. Uh, it's still the weekend, technically right now. So, Evo! Uh, did I make one for you? No, I'll fix that. It'll fix. I'll fix it. How are you doing, Evo Lazi? Uh, I feel like my entire audience when I stream is just other streamers. <laughs> I don't know if that's normal. <laughs> I'm the streamer streamer. Uh, this is Arachnatiscus internal. I get, like, uh, occasionally somebody who's not a streamer who shows up in my channel to see what I'm up to. Uh, right now we're looking at some material that Pacific Plankton sent me, and not surprisingly, it's from the Pacific, and it's Plankton. Um... These monster diatoms are, uh, filled with holes, as usual. That one's kind of cool. You can see all the little tiny circles are filled with a bunch of other little circles, so... Uh, and we're just kind of rolling around in the sample looking for fun stuff. Uh, that's an Isthmia, that's Costanodiscus, I think. Uh, that's a broken piece of a Thalassocyra, I think. It's a lot of the usual suspects from uh, from Pacific Plankton streams, as you might expect. Um, but that uh, Arachnodiscus is kind of cool. I haven't seen one of those before. And I'm looking for an even better one. So we'll see how it does, how that goes. Not sure what that is. Giant diatom. 
think it's costing the discus again. Based on the size of this one, I think it's the the one that we put the mustache on for Mustachio. I think it's uh, Cosinodiscus whales, whales eye, whales eye, whales eye, or Wallace eye, something like that. Also, don't know what this weird little guy is. I think it's a Cosinodiscus. If it's in the marine realm, and I don't know what it is, uh, it's usually it usually ends up being the last Osira. But there's a Ismia. There's some Actinopticus. Uh, Tintinids still together despite being processed. Cassinodiscus. Big diatom, point of raid at us. Not sure, could be arachnodiscus. It's really big, but there's a glare on it because it's pointed right at the detector. And unfortunately, I don't have any way to stopping a glare. Oh, it's a 4am. That's what that other one was, too. That's a 4am. A little 4am You can see, here's his belly button, and then it coils outward like this. Kind of like a snail. For mind of a snail. Um, but it's fractured so you can see into the actual valve. We saw another one that was just like the centerpiece of that. I just couldn't tell what it was without any context, but now I know. Um, a lot of times that's what I have to do is kind of go look around on the slide if I find a fragment of something and try to figure out what it was or what it is. Tintinid. Poop. Streamers of a feather flock together. Yeah. Gotta pull on your adult pants. That's why I'm here, right? Um, how does she send you the samples? Is it just some drops in the mail? Uh, she sends. I sent her some um, centrifuge tubes and. Um, she usually puts them in those, but it could be in any container, really, that's waterproof. And then uh, she just packs them so they don't uh, get destroyed in transport. So wrap them carefully, basically. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, sometimes it's mud samples. Um, or uh, whatever, but I will process them here. That's what I usually do. So um, for these marine samples, we usually rinse them, uh, get out the salts, and then process them in nitric acid. You know what? Uh, something... There's a little Ketosterous chain. I saw some... Uh, Basilaria, I thought, in the... 
in the live material that I looked at in the light microscope earlier. And we should try to see if we can find some of that. We're always so zoomed out looking at the really large stuff because there's so much of it. Let's see what's on three. Look how the difference between those two samples. Those must have been the live ones. And these ones are processed. You can see how it gets rid of all those like lumps of things and now it's just diatoms everywhere. Um, the whole slide just basically diatoms. Got rid of all the poop, basically. Which is what the processing did. And, and now we just see like a pile of round things. Um, there's also some non-round things in here that I keep seeing, and I'm gonna focus on one of them if I can find it separated from the rest of this material. Um, I was also seeing some Campylia discus when I was looking through those samples, so I'm kind of looking around to see if I can find some. Oh, there's an arachnidiscus. Almost perfect. I just had a little piece of junk on it. That's a good one. Okay. Get this in focus for us. Ooh, that's pretty. We can come take a look at the internal structure inside the... Oh, yeah. That's really cool. Inside these little pores, there's really intricate structures all over the place. Super neat. just one like this so we can see the internal structure really clearly that's a uh, coffee table photo for you for the books it's gonna look good colorized do one like this and then I'll zoom out. Let's see. Let's lower the beam intensity just a little. It'll make this image a bit darker, but it'll pick up just a little bit more detail. Uh, do you age ancient diatom samples from the diatoms themselves or from the surrounding material? The surrounding material, Sam. Uh, you can't use... Well, let me rephrase that. Usually the surrounding material. Typically you can't age... You can't determine the age of something from the diatoms. Like, we can't date the diatom material. But um, in some parts of the world um, where diatoms are evolving, you can actually get into looking at the biostratigraphy. Um, mostly it's in the marine realm. They don't really have that for freshwater stuff very much. Um, but you can figure out like the age of marine samples based on when a diatom evolved into being or when they went extinct. Um, that's pretty common. So <laughs> thesis writing mode on. Okay, good. Get that thesis done. The junk makes it perfect. <laughs> um, Cargo Cult, hello. How are you doing? We are uh, checking out some samples that uh, Pacific Plankton has sent me. 
and um, I was looking for arachnodiscus and I found it. So here we are looking at some giant diatom, but we're just looking at a little piece of it. Uh, when I say giant diatom, though, keep in mind they're still pretty small, still a less than a millimeter in size. Uh, Sam, I'm here to answer questions, so don't feel like you're asking too many. Um, as long as I can keep up with them, ask as many as you like. Um, are the diatoms checking? They are right now. Um, we've got an entire stub just filled with diatoms, which is the, you know, the best kind, in my opinion. Um, they're not attacking me. They're attacking the screen. But definitely we see them. All these cool structures are just amazing. These little internal like I shapes and X shapes. That one's kind of a Y shape. All right, this is Arachnodiscus internal. Areoli. That's a nice picture. And then we can zoom out and look at the entire wagon wheel here. So as I mentioned, this diatom is arachnodiscus, uh, like arachnophobia. It's named after spiders because the person who named the genus thought that in the light microscope, they looked a bit like a spider web. And I agree with them. They do look like spider webs, probably because they hadn't invented wagon wheels by that point. Um, maybe they had, I don't know. Uh, like a Conestoga covered wagon kind of look. That's a gorgeous diatom. If we just hadn't gotten a little bit of crap on the side down here in the corner, we'd have the whole thing. These marine diatoms are so huge. Hopefully everybody got a nice dose of fireworks last night, and hopefully people get it out of their systems. Um, I posted a bunch of cool firework photos that I took. If you're interested in seeing them, I think you can get to them from my Instagram account. The bottom one, not the top one. Um, Some of them are pretty special. I like them a lot. They don't even look like fireworks. They just look like art to me. The uh, live composite mode on my camera is amazing. And it just allows me to capture as much of the fireworks as I want and then just stop, start, stop whenever I like. Always perfectly exposed. Um, so. Fireworks are easy and fun to image with a camera, uh, with a real camera, if you know what you're doing. Um, so I really like getting out and then being able to just collect some cool images. Mostly I can watch the fireworks, I don't even have to look at my camera. Except for making decisions about when to turn it on and off the, a shot. So it's nice. You see this sort of shadow right here and then this sort of area of the uh, image that's really bright? 
It's because that's facing the, uh, the sensor, like as if a flashlight was reflecting off of a surface. And there's actually a shadow behind it um, that's created the same way. Like, like you would if you were looking at it with a flashlight. Let's look around and see if we can find another one. That's a nice Actinopticus. Let's see what else we can find in these mysterious samples. Sponge picule. It's a giant piece of Ismia. Diatom's kind of hanging out. Oh, it's an, it's an arachnidiscus. sitting on a pile of junk right there. Would have been a good one if it had been flat. So we could see it all. This is a glasses Syrah. Portula. That's a rather large Actinopticus. You can really see the room of Portula on the inside are curly these little round things. That's the room of Portula. They're like coiled. Like a little ear. And there's three of them, one for each um, depression on the valve face. And there's another arachnidiscus right there. And that one's broken. That's an external view. Get up and look really closely at some of the structure, though. I think we can still do that even though we've got a broken one. This is the outside of those weird looking X shaped pores that we were seeing. So you can get a good sense of how it looks from the outside. And it's a little blurry because I have the beam intensity back up too high. There we go. It's crazy that that's the way that pour looks. Can have really fascinating pours. Find one that's not got a view with any junk on it, just like that.
That is incredibly intricate. So that's uh, speed 7, speed 6, and speed 5, or sorry, speed 7 with beam intensity 7, speed 7 with beam intensity 6, and that's speed 8 with beam intensity 5. You can see how the image quality improves each step of those as I did that. And even though it's kind of a long wait, I'm just going to go ahead and um, collect this at a long beam intensity because I really love how this structure is. That's just amazing to me in there that um, the intricate nature of those pores is just absolutely spectacular. Okay, and maybe I'll fix the uh, brightness of contrast again. So it doesn't look quite so dark. So it'll be a bit of a long exposed, take a while before it finishes, but uh, <laughs> the Millennial Falcon. <laughs> um, if we donate, will money go to diatoms? Uh, Cargo Cult, if you donate, money will go to student research in my lab, um, or to buy supplies to continue to run the SEM for people on Twitch. Um, I don't take any of the money, so your money will come in, I will pay taxes on it, and then I will use it to buy materials for the lab for my students or myself um, for the stream. <laughs> uh, shield projector dish, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a little bit like the famous enhance option that they show on TV series. Um, you know, those are complete BS because if your camera can collect information at a high resolution, why would you collect it at a low resolution and then turn it up to high? Um, you know, they do have some pretty cool programs like Topaz, which will take stuff that's kind of fuzzy and then figure out where it thinks lines should be. It uses artificial intelligence to try to figure out um, the actual structures of things, and then it will literally enhance the photo and sharpen it at the same time. Um, I don't use that software, but I was thinking about buying it one of these days. My sister sort of raves about it. She just takes pictures in relatively high ISO and then um, we'll run it through that to clean up the images. But that's as close as we get to actually enhance. Do geometers ever do stuff with any of your imagery? Replaces very small eyes with very small mouths. You've used it, it's sorcery. Uh, I'll take your word for it, Bill. Um, do geometers ever do stuff with your imagery? I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think anybody does anything with my imagery other than me. Uh, uh, this is very fractal though, isn't it? Isn't it very kind of fractal? Like crazy structures repeated. I don't know. This one's a cool one. Um. <laughs> I run, the, <laughs> run it through several times. <laughs> Keep running it through until it turns everything into mouths. And there's a lot of math that could be done to figure out the fine structure. I bet there is. Um, you know, one of my grad students had this idea that um, 
you know, the diatoms, this one is very shield shaped, right? So if you were trying to, and, and it's repeated sections over and over. So if you're trying to like optimize the code for that, like to redraw it as a program, um, you just have to have that arc shape and then you could just repeat it over and over again, right? Um, so you just think about the DNA that the organism's using to make that and then how you could you know, reduce it down to just a few elements that are repeated over and over again. Um, and that, you know, there may be some value in understanding the mathematical relationships and then trying to look at it mathematically in terms of like what's being kept as the code to design things. And, you know, I wonder if you found the code for these like areoli in the DNA, if it's just a simple thing that gets repeated over and over until it, it makes that shape. Huh? Um, I thought it was kind of a cool idea, of, uh, a cool way of looking at diatoms. I don't think people typically look at them that way. Um, there's a bunch of interesting stuff that goes on when diatoms can't make a shape that I think would be really interesting to look at. Um, you know, these aren't all identical. They are some of them are sort of squares and some of them are x's and some of them are y's and i think it's because they build it and then they have to kind of fill it in right <laughs> the future topaz will sequence our dna's uh, if you keep running it through maybe i don't know it'll just be all mouths at that point i like this image though I'm going to denoise it a little bit and then uh, colorize it. It's going to be gorgeous. I'm going to try to make it look like a tie-dye. It would be very cool. It looks like, uh, like the structure of a suburb, you know? Like, uh, I don't know if you've looked at, like, suburbs from from an airplane before, how the roads are kind of windy, but then they're in contained little packages. Very similar to that. You found something along the lines of what you're saying. Oh, cool, someone had a nature article. Yeah. Now oh, this is cool. I'm going to... I don't know any of these people, um, these people that are talking about it, but I'm going to post it in my Discord so I can find it later. Thank you for that link. Two thousand seventeen. It's a good year for diatoms. <laughs> uh, what if the whole humankind is a big diatom? I mean, it's possible we're on a giant diatom, like. The dark matter structure is actually a skeletal composition. Now I feel like we really are in the realm of things you talk about when you get high. Level up and add your own sticker creations for your server. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put it into general science good place for it and I'll come back and look look at read it when I get a chance I'll tell you what I think about it thanks for finding that for us but <laughs> it's diatoms the whole way down <laughs> it could be you never know uh, I'm afraid we wouldn't uh, we would never know about it if that were the case but you know We need to find a mid-range diatom, or a planet-sized diatom.
like a Star Trek episode with a giant diatom the size of a planet. We're almost there. And then I can zoom out, take another picture of something else. I like this one though. That's a winner. It's gonna make next year's calendar, I think. <laughs> I'm gonna start designing them early this year. I don't think I got my calendar together for my SEM lab until uh, January, which is too late if you wanna sell calendars, to be honest. Not that I care to sell them. But okay, let's get at it. It was pretty cool we got that from a piece of junk. Like, degraded... Oh, too bright. Um, fractured piece of a diatom, right? And we still could get a cool picture of that. Structure with that even from a little piece, just this little tiny bit was enough. Well, I already feel like we've mission accomplished this thing, uh, this sample, because we got a nice arachnidiscus, we got a nice crazy close view of some of the pores on them, and uh, there's a bunch of really pretty valves here that don't have a lot of junk on them, which is nice. And each one of these holes, if we zoom in, it's just more holes. Let's go look. Let's see what else we can find in our sample. Ten. Look, there's another arachnidiscus. That one's broken. Look how gorgeous the middle on this one is, though. <laughs> one misplaced. The rest of them all perfect. And then there's a big giant crack in it. See if we can find one that doesn't have that giant crack in it. If not, we can always come back. pile of diatoms in the middle of this sample. That's a lot of diatoms.
There's a whole bunch of them clustered together. There's a fragment of one. This thing is so huge. Also fractured. Look how crazy it looks when you zoom out. That's interesting. Okay. Um, there's also some of these other things in here I want to check out kind of a lot of them actually. Just want to sort of finish going through the broad view and then I'm going to try to zoom in on one of them. There's a uh, radiolarium. It's another one. Let's look at some of these other things. So, this is a really pretty diatom. We've seen a bunch of these on the stream before. This cool pattern. Now I just need to turn each one of these little guys into a mouth by running it through Toolpaths, right? It'll be perfect. Okay, uh, let's see. Fibonacci spirals. How much of the world is formed by the corpses of diatoms? A pretty small fraction, Bill. Um, you know, they're silt-sized particles, and they dissolve um, a lot of times before they reach the bottom of the ocean, so... Um, 
Unserkind. Greets from Germany. One man show today. Yeah, all my assistants have the day off. Uh, in fact, I think the whole university has the day off, and I just don't pay any attention to holidays. So. Barbado Black Belly. Barbados Black Belly. Neat. Yeah. Diatoms are pretty neat. Uh, what goes in between those holes in the voids? <laughs> um, so when the organism's living, there's sort of an organic layer, um, you know, because they're single-celled organisms, it's cytoplasm or protoplasm, um, that uh, kind of covers over the outside of the diatom as a membrane, um, as part of the cell wall. And what we're really looking at is a silicified cell wall um, for diatoms, which are a type of algae, but they're single cells. And um, so this is just the structure of the, you know, the skeleton of the diatom. No, those aren't individual cells. So um, all of what you're seeing here is just one cell. And those are just little openings in the cell. And they largely use them to exchange nutrients with the, and communicate with the outside world. So they're exchanging nutrients and, um, and waste. So, you know, nutrients come in, waste goes out. Um, they're not like vacuoles. Vacuoles are usually like a, a bubble of, of gas. They're more like a pore, yeah, like on your skin, the same way that your skin has pores that allow it to um, exchange air and, and, you know, let sweat come out, basically. Um, they're, usually they would have their chloroplasts, and I think for most diatoms, their chloroplasts are sort of associated with the areoli somewhat closely, but that's not always the case. Um, so the, you know, the, why they have that structure, I, I really don't know. I think it's partly um, the, uh, the ultrastructure is sort of determined by the rigidity or the integrity of the skeleton. So, um, you know, it's to provide structure for the, um, the cell wall to have strength so that they can get buffeted or whatever, bumped by things. Um, in some cases, when they get digested, they don't get uh, completely digested as a result. Um, but, you know, there's basically nothing goes in between those um, openings. They're openings that are meant for exchange with nutrients. So, um, and they all have many different kinds. I mean, each diatom has their own sort of pore structures and covers and um, those things that we usually think of as occlusions that go over the, the hole. Um, and this is another diatom right here, this like lima bean shaped thing. You can see all the little holes right there. Um, they're not all round. <laughs> a lot of times in Pacific plankton samples, there's a lot of round ones because a lot of the plankton is round. Um, but diatoms have many different shapes, as we'll see. If you stick around for a little bit and I jump over to the mountain lake samples, um, there's not a lot of round ones in it. Um, I think there may be a few, but most of them are not round um, in those because they're benthic. Um, the ones that float, that are drifters, um, they tend to be round. They tend to have this shape, although not always. Um, this is another one. This is a Costanodiscus periphera. And those little bright spots that you see right there and there and there and there, they're actually little um, uh, mouth-shaped structures. And I feel like, uh, you know, you're going to be really excited when you see that. <laughs> they look like little mouths. If you were expecting the, uh, the Titan holes to be replaced by mouths, this one's smiling at us. Um, I'm going to zoom in and you'll see what I mean. Uh, this is a labia process. Right here. 
and when it's perfectly in focus, it will look like a little mouth. Each one of these little bright spots will look like a little mouth. Like, like a smiley face, and there's another smiley face. And there's another one, and another. As we come out here away from the middle, you'll see that it's got a bunch of these little uh, labia processes that look like mouths. Especially when I slow it down, then it'll look like a wall with a bunch of eyes and a mouth. Have, have fun trying to get to sleep tonight. That's all I'm going to say about that. Alright, seven. Uh, beam intensity. Let's take it to six. Okay, uh, can they close them? No, um, they're part of the skeleton, so they're made out of silica. They don't open or close. Um, do they have neurons? No, they're single-celled organisms. Uh, but they're cytoplasm, yes. A neuron is a type of cell, yes. Uh, and they're single-celled, yes. You're all over it, Cargo Cult. You didn't need me help. Uh, it needs a mustache. Uh, I agree, it does need a mustache, and I feel like we can do something about that. I won't even charge you points for it. I'll just go ahead and put it on there. Uh, let's see. How do I fix it, though? I'll mock it. Uh, transform? We need to rotate it. Oh, I feel like that's going very slowly. Let's take it to zero, and then <laughs> gentlemanly. Uh, let's see, maybe twenty-five, or is it minus twenty-five? Oh, I went the wrong way. That's not bad. Um, just shrink it down a little. <laughs> that one only has one eye. We need to find one that has... Oh, here, this will do. That one's almost a zero. Let's see. <laughs> uh, right there? No, it's, it's mustaches in its eyes. Probably we should make it small and make it match its, its mouth. Oh, now it's moving. <laughs> I could put it up there like a hairdo. Oh, it would be pretty cool as like a curly hairdo. There we go. Now it's a mustache. Pretty close to the right size. <laughs> I'll be blamed for faking science. Um, I don't care. People can say whatever they want. Uh, the truth is out there. Where's Fox Mulder? That one's got a sideways mouth. This one's the best one, I think. Um, let's see. When it's done, I'll zoom out a little. <laughs> you want to believe? Uh, when it's done, I'll zoom out a little bit, and I'll stop scrolling. And then we can... Uh, I'm just going to call this one Wall of Mouths. Although it's Peripher. Uh, let's see. If we zoom out... There. Now, uh, let's see if I can come back here and uh, put on the mustache without it moving on me. There we go. 
How's that? Good? I'm happy with it. Are you happy with it? <laughs> uh, it's what we're going with. It's got a French curl on this mustache. Okay. Um, good. Nobody even paid for that one. It's just for free mustache I put on there. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see what else we can find. Zoom out. Look how clean that one is. I feel like I should maybe get a picture of it. Just because it doesn't have any trash on it. It's not broken. It's got a little tiny piece of junk right there, and that's it. It's kind of rare to find things in the SCM that don't have any trash on them. Seven and seven. Brightness. It's uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. I better take a look at those mountain samples. We'll do that next. It's looking good. It's like a pizza. It's perfectly flat. Um, if you could grow giant diatoms, do you think you could break into the shower head? <laughs> that would be a great shower head right there. Um, I would just design a piece of metal to look like that and go ahead and put it on a shower head and sell it as diatom shower heads. Um, or sprinklers. You're right, Bit. Um, you know, in my lab, when people look at diatoms enough, then they start to see them in all kinds of things, like hubcaps and, you know, light fixtures and sewer drains and uh, sprinkler heads, if you like, uh, Coke bottles, whatever. Um, uh, and so we used to do a thing, I haven't had any students do it recently, where they'd be out, you know, looking at things and then they would see something that looks like a diatom and then they would take a picture of it you know and then we would all try to figure out what its genus is um and so you know i'm not saying take a picture of your shower head and send it to me on the discord and i'll tell you what genus it is but i think if you did i could tell you probably which genus it is <laughs> um or your hubcaps or uh a clocks Sometimes if you just go to a hotel, they have like fancy art up that looks like diatoms. Um, one, of, uh, one of my fellow streamers, uh, I'm gonna send her a shout out right there. Oh no, that's me. Uh, I want uh, HRM, that's what I want. Um, Hannah and Rebecca, she, first stream I saw her, she had like, she was staying at this people's house and they had a pillow that looked like a diatom. And I was like, your diatom looks like a pillow. Your pillow looks like a diatom. And she, uh, and she was very confused. But um, now I've got a whole song she sings about me. It's right here. Check that out if you're looking for something fun. And when she streams it, we can just spam our diatom emotes. Um, that's what we do nowadays. So you should check out Hannah. She's a, a great musician, songwriter. Um, and she wrote a song about me, which I don't think anybody's ever done before, so kind of cool. And it's about diatoms. Speaking of pillows that follow our passions, I ordered a couple from my RV, and they look like giant silica packets. Do you know the silica packets actually are, um, probably have diatoms in them, Bill? They're probably, um, <laughs> uh, they're probably filled with silica gel, which is actually just diatoms. Uh, Custom discus periphera. Per, per, I think it's periphera. Or peripheratus. Something like that. 
nobody pays me to do the genus and species for marine diatoms. So when I get them good, get them close, that's all I need to do. Um, if you want me to identify something better than that, it, it should be freshwater. And that will solve that problem. The freshwater diatoms I'm good at. The marine ones, I don't know. That's how you end up with a species called wall of mouths. Um, let's see. We're like off on the edge. Let's move back towards the middle. I'm gonna, I'm almost certainly gonna come back to these samples uh, because on Wednesday, I'll probably wanna take a look, another look at them um, and see what else I can find. I think maybe Pacific Plankton will wanna be here and she can always watch the VOD, but I feel like, you know, she sent me the samples. I should probably at least have her get a chance to watch it live. And, you know, she wants me to go take pictures of something I can. Um, so we'll probably come back to these. Let's go look at one of these up close. Can we see into them? Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. They kind of have cool. They kind of have cool pores on them as well. Oh, that's got crusty stuff all over it. Okay, let's go look. I've got some samples from another site that Pacific Plankton sent me. These ones are from a lake. And um, the lake is very cleverly named Mountain Lake um, in California. And as you might guess, uh, it's a lake in the mountains. You know, they came up with a good name for it. Um, and I'm always making fun of, um, don't mind me, California. I'm always making fun of people's names for lakes when they just pick something nearby, like, you know, or they just pick the shape of it, or they pick an adjective that's like really um, overly simple, like blue lake, fish lake, uh, pretty lake. Um, Mountain Lake fits right in there, though. I hadn't thought of Mountain Lake before, and Mountain Lake is, that's a perfect uh, example of that. It's a non-round diatom. I think it's Cockanese. Based on this structure right here, these little things on the, uh, Bubba copula. Catasterus cockanis. That's Actinocyclus right there. That's an Actinocyclus. It has all these little trumpet shaped, um, yeah, little mouths around the outside edge of it. Uh, I like Actinocyclus. That's a cool one. These are Thalassus syra. I'm pretty good at recognizing marine diatoms. Um, only trained by the fact that uh, I already know the freshwater ones, but it's not super helpful. <laughs> there are almost no overlap. So especially for the round ones, I just have to figure them out and, uh, and then figure out why it belongs to that group. That's a detillum. Sometimes they're triangle shaped. And this is another piece of plankton in here. Not so much, uh, skeletonema or anything. Oh, there's one of these really long. This is Thalassiothrix. This guy right here. That's all one diatom. It's like 300 microns. See, it starts here, it's still going over there. That's 800 microns. 
That's. I think we found one that was like three millimeters once. Just went on forever. That's a about a millimeter and a half. That one. It's a big diatom. You could see it and pick it up with tweezers, probably. Okay, let's. Uh, oh, that's a cool pattern. Let's go look at the mountain lake sample after I made fun of the name. Um, and we can check out some freshwater diatoms. Bloop. I think it's this one. Oh. So here we are. We're no longer in the round diatom realm. <laughs> this sample is full of sororella. That's a lot of sororella. Uh, these little guys here, those are actually really cool. Those are Terpsino, and that's also a girdle view version of Terpsino right there, I think. And you can see this sample is totally dominated by these Sororella. It's just mostly Sororella, these leaf-shaped things. And then there's another Sororella, a different, chena, a different species. That one's wiggly. Used to be Campylidiscus got moved. Um, and this is a giant Cymbella. That's Mexicana. But you weren't expecting that. That's the stigma and it's like star-shaped. Super cool. Um, if it's really Cymbella Mexicana, which I think it is, that also has really cool external, like alphabet-like uh, pores, which we'll take a look at. When we're done playing around with some of these other things, this is Terpsino, this is Amphora, Cervarellas, everywhere Cervarellas. Uh, that is Calanese Amphisbana. That's the Calanese is the genus, Amphisbana is the species name. And This is the Rafi. A lot of the round ones don't have Rafi, but the non-round ones have them. And colonies like Pinularia have a bunch of little tiny holes that make up the uh, stride. So if we zoom in, we ought to be able to see those holes. There they are. It's like an open chamber with a bunch of little holes on the inside. Those are the holes on the outside. We're just seeing the internal expression of them. Um, I know this one uh, because to species, one, I've had it before in samples, and two, um, it used to be my wife's favorite diatom, so when I see it, I always know which one. It's a cool diatom. I want an external view of that if we can find one. It would be cool. Um, Terpsino is also a really cool diatom, and these, um, that's an epithemia. They have really cool structures on the outsides of them as well. Their stri are like, I don't know, intricate. see that a little bit in here. Looks like it's a dissolve it's a bit dissolved. Um, sorry, I know I've been away from chat for a while. I'll come back in a second. I just want to get us something good to get a picture of. Um, like an external view of the Terpsino or
Let's see what this looks like up close. Oh, these ones are kind of like X-shaped. There they are. Like little calligraphy patterns. Um, that's Cimbella Mexicana. As I mentioned, the, um, the stri always look like this. They're composed of these really intricate, they look like hieroglyphic characters, basically. So the whole things are that way. And we see these regularly in California. I never realized how common, because um, we don't see them very frequently here, but a lot of the samples that um, I've seen from like Dell and Pacific Plankton are filled with that, uh, that diatom. It's really common in California. Cervarella everywhere. It's another internal view of that same diatom, it's Calanese. Thought it might have been an external. That's Mexicana again, I think. Yeah. Interesting. Hello. Little Diplonies. These are a type of diplonies that I see in these other samples that I'm looking at right now from uh, White Sands National Park. So either it's a piece of contamination or just a diatom that both lakes have in common. But it's a cool one. So we'll stop here and take a look at it and get a picture. And I can see what chat's been saying. Well, I've been ignoring you. Um, let's see. <laughs> Imagine the battle that yielded all these corpses. Yeah. Uh, it was just a battle with gravity, I'm afraid. Uh, we need a new form of religion. What do diatoms eat? Bit, they are... Uh, they're phytoplankton. They eat sunlight. That's it. Uh, carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, uh, and some micronutrients. Um, uh, <laughs> I've never seen any babies at this scale. <laughs> I hope you all put see the video I put in Discord later. I'll check it out. Um, I wish I was a diatom. Well, what does the stigma do? I have no idea, actually. A bit. I have no idea what the stigma does, um, and I don't know. Some of the diatoms have many. Most of them have none. <laughs> Looks like my phone speaker. Oh, that stigma. Yeah, a little bit. You can also take pictures of your phone speaker and uh, and send those. And I'll try to identify it to genus. Um, yeah, the humming in my voice. I'm just here to put people to sleep. That's my main job. Uh, and then I've got the visual ASMR on the SCM to round it out. Um, we're just here 
putting people to sleep and giving them the ASMR they deserve. Um, that is one diatom, and um, this is just one valve. So it's actually half of a diatom. Um, not that it's splitting, but that's actually the shape of the outline of the diatom, and we're looking at the inside of it. So um, there's another one that would fit over top of it that's exactly the same shape as this one. Um, that would be the outside view if we could see it. Um, that's the internal view of one diatom. And when diatoms split, they actually would divide in the direction that we see it. They would add, like, um, girdle bands, make themselves a little bit wider, and then form a new half of a valve inside on this one, and a new half of a valve inside on this one, and then it split apart into two diatoms. They would still all look like this, though. Um, their skeleton, which is what we're looking at, is rigid. It's an exoskeleton, basically, an external skeleton. And so um, the skeleton doesn't divide. It's, it's always um, rigid. It's always the same shape. So this is half of a diatom. Um, it's a diplonese. And a lot of the diplonese um, in the marine realm have this sort of peanut shape like this, um, like a um, multi-lobe or bilobate shape. Uh, the diplonese that are found in the marine realm more typically, I should say, have that shape. Uh, this is Mountain Lake. I'm going to go up a level and make a new folder. Mountain Lake. And this is uh, diplonese of some kind. Um, I don't think that's a... Uh, Um, I think it's because they just have elevated salinity in this system. Uh, whatever mountain lake is, I think it actually has uh, slightly elevated salinity. And the reason I think that is, um, this thing is common in marine uh, settings, or it could just be contaminated. And um, the terpsino, the big thing, uh, the other big thing that's in here that we've been looking, not these guys, those are... Cerellas, um, this thing is actually more common in like coastal marine settings, these things right here. And let's go take a look at one of these. This is an external view. It looks like the ends are broken out on it, which is crappy because I kind of want a picture of the ends. I don't want a broken one. Um, it's a little heavily, it's pretty heavily dissolved actually, and the ends are all broken out, um, which suggests maybe it's been transported rather than living in the lake, which is also possible. It could be that they, they're blown in um, by the wind. The lake is pretty close to the coast, and um, it's very possible that some of these are actually blown in. It would be weird to have this many blown in. Um, especially because they're all over the place in the sample. Um, here's another one in girdle view of that same thing. Um, this is Pinularia right there. Uh, that is Star Anise. That's Simbella. That's Cerebrella. That's Amphora. Um, I have another sample that has these... Uh, the same material, I think. That's a, a girdle, a side view of the Terpsino again. So you can see this sort of shape um, a little bit more clearly here. Um, it's like coming, it's like waves coming towards us a little bit. Um, it's on its side. That's the broken ends. The ends are all broken out of every one of these. <laughs> That's the one part I kind of wanted to zoom in and take a look at. Uh, it's it's missing. Um, probably because they're the weakest, most lightly solidified part of the diatom. So if you're wondering why are all the ends busted out, it's because the apical pore fields are on there. Something called an uh, an acellus uh, or pseudoacellus, and they. Um, they form in here. Uh, this one might actually have its 
no, they're broken out. It's busted out again. Um, and then they have a rim of portula right there. That's the rim of portula. It's a little. It's like a twisted little mouth with a wry grin on it. Um, and they have these huge costi. Uh, that's a science word for rib, <laughs> rib structure. Is this one? The ends are broken off of it. Every one of them that we've seen, the ends are all busted out. But the middle part of this one looks pretty good, actually. Um, they're so heavily um, solicified. There's the room of portula part. Um, they're so heavily solicified that basically they're likely to be preserved even if they're transported. Um, that's why I was thinking that might be it might be a transport artifact, but there's a lot. So it could just be that they were in like high wave area of the water and they're just getting beat up by rolling around. Communition, basically. Well, they're a little bit larger than most of the other diatoms that are here, so. And um, these other guys, the Cerarellas that are here, are pretty common in wavy, wave-dominated uh, water as well. I think because they can be flipped over many different ways and still um, can still crawl around. So this structure that's right here, most people don't think of algae as being able to crawl, but diatoms can. Um, the benthic ones in particular have this structure called a ray feed, which allows them to crawl around. Um, there you can really see the pores on the valve face, um, on the, uh, the stri for this pinularia. That's uh, the ray feed structure that it uses to crawl with, and these are um, now these tiny little holes are uh, pores that are covering over costy structure to make stride. The detail is pretty cool. see if I can jump over to the other sample. It's the same material, but um, it might be arranged on the slide a little bit better than this one. I don't know. There's a lot. Again, a lot of um, <laughs> the Cerarella. Let's also take a close look at one of the Cerarellas uh, here in a second. Um, very likely, this is Terpsino Musica. Um, and it has a sort of a structure in here that when you see it in the light microscope, it looks a bit like a musical note. This diatom again has a raphe. That is it's kind of an interesting diatom. It's an anomenese. Um, they have this sort of landing strip-like structure um, that runs along the raphe, and then the rest of the stri are very um, sparsely spread out across the valve. Let's see. Um, 
145, 165. Hey Luke, how's it going? Uh, would the electron ray on one of the microscopes kill living bacteria? Yes. The electron, also the vacuum that they're in probably would kill it. Um, <laughs> very visually stimulating. Good. I'm glad you feel that way. Also, thank you for the follow, Art. Um, it reminds me of going hiking through the mountains and staring at all the striations in the geology. Ooh, look at you using geological terms. Um, have you forgotten about looking up chip transistors and SEM suggestion? I haven't forgotten about it. Um, in fact, I think there's some back here, uh, but nobody sent me any transistors to look at yet. <laughs> I just got here. What's the name of that organism? Um, I don't know which one you wanted. Uh, this is a diatom. We're all looking at all diatoms. This one is a nominee. I think it's Ferrophora, but I'm not positive about that. Um, is that the sample edge? It's the edge of the stub. We got all this stuff from the algae pool. I got all of this stuff from my friend Pacific Plankton, who streams on Twitch. And she sent me the material um, through the mail. Um, they are diatoms, yes. You'd like to see a video of how the samples are prepared. Um, well,. I don't know if I have a video of it, but I could do a stream where I showed it one of these times. You like her Twitch name? Well, you should give her a follow. Um, she does really great stuff. She looked at this stuff in the light microscope while it was living and then sent it to me so I could put it in the SEM and make her some samples that were mounted. And I did that today. That's why we're looking at it. So um, she's a really great streamer. And if you like microscope stuff, um, there's a whole list of really great microscope streamers right there for you. Um, all of them, at least at some time during their stream, use some microscopes uh, for what they're doing. And um, I'm probably missing some now. I'm probably There's probably some more. Um, I saw somebody looking at microchips with a microscope before, occasionally. What if Pacific Plankton just 3D prints all diatoms and puts them into the probe. Um, well, uh, she's got a pretty small 3D printer, if that's the case. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations for her technology skills. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I don't think it's likely that that's what's going on, but um, she's got going to have a bunch of people calling her. A nom OE. Anomonies. Uh, SP. External. Yeah, it's Rafra, I think. Well, we'll take a look at it. Because uh, maybe it's not Sraphra. Um, there's an internal view of epithemia. With the costi. And a whole bunch of. are broken out in this one too, I think. Uh, it's not surprising. There's a cool Cirrella. It's the one that we saw before with the wavy lines on it. This used to be a 
think it used to be in Smetaplura. When you get in really close, what you'll see is that surface is composed of a whole bunch of little tiny dots, as many diatoms are. Those are these striae right there. That is the raphe for this diatom, which runs along an edge, a keeled edge. These ones have the same thing. This is uh, the valve view or the face view, and that's the girdle view of the same diatom. And that one's three quarters. So you can see all the sides at once, and that's a girdle band. Ends are broken out. structure of it a lot better right there. Let's zoom in and look at one of these guys. Um, similarly, the surface of this is also composed with a bunch of holes, which you can see right there pretty easily. See all the little holes on the surface? And then it has these fibula structures and little wings that the raphe is sitting in. There's the raphe. There's a ton of those things in the sample. Pinularia. Again, key characteristic of Pinularia is the striae are composed of a bunch of costi with little sort of a skin over the surface of them. Um, that's filled with a bunch of little holes. see those very clearly here. And they're bilaterally symmetrical. That one actually has the ends preserved. And you can see those got little tiny holes down there. The apical pore fields or the acelli are preserved on this one, so not all of them have their ends busted out. This one's got a bunch of junk in it though, which isn't helpful. We're trying to look at pretty structures on the insides. This is star anise right here. Again, it has a raphe, runs down the middle, an axial raphe. And then this structure right here is the staros. It's like a big thickened piece of silica that runs across the valve. For this genus, that's characteristic. Um, there are some other diatoms that have something similar called a fascia. And there's some pseudo 
Star and East like things um, that were split off pretty recently, or maybe re erected recently. Closely related, but imperfectly. The whole end's busted off of that one. The samples are kind of fairly well dissolved for having been collected live. And also, they're dominated by benthic stuff for something that's, I think, Pacific Plankton collected these with a plankton net. So, they must have been just washed up from uh, wave energy. Ten minutes or so left before I'm probably going to call it a day. And um, there was something in here I wanted to find. Unfortunately, they're very small. Ooh. What are you? It's an oxyspore for an Olicocyra, I think. It's an oxyspore for something, anyway. Melocyra, maybe. Um, a colleague of mine asked me if I'd ever seen an oxyspore in the SCM, and I said, I don't think so, but I think that's what that is. So I'm going to have to send this to her. Let's see. Uh, 40, maybe? Okay, let's get it back into focus. hear the lab door opening. Dr. Stone. Hello. Aha. Uh -huh. It's it's what is that? It's a good question. Huh? That's Are a good question. Are you having a paper? No. That's a paper's worth. I believe it's a diatom regenerating. Degenerating? Regenerating. Oh, had one too many? <laughs> uh, if one too many means sex, then yes. I think it's uh, an oxyspore. 
Oh. With the uh, capsule that it came out of still attached. Hmm. It is kind of cool. What are you doing in the coterminous U.S.? Um, I, that's a good question. I asked myself that also. Uh, what are you doing? I live here. <laughs> in the, in, right here? <laughs> I've only ever lived on the coterminous U.S. Yeah, I think it's Melisira. I think it's just a Melisira in its oxyspore. I, I saw a, 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 a Zeiss, $1.2 million SEM. Did you pick it up? <laughs> Brand new. It has a, a laser, and it can cut through, and then take images on the side, and you can put it together. 3D, it's like a CT scanner. Just amazing for for micro uh, size things, and it has it can freeze freeze dry, uh, freeze dry things too. And it has to be freeze frozen. Well, you very should quickly. you should have gotten us two of them, one for you and one for me. And it has a huge screen, circular screen. Could I mean, we could use, get a bigger screen. Could you use something like that? Could I use it? Yeah, one that goes you know laser. And it has, uh, you know, obviously uh, 3D images and uh, elemental analysis. You know, like I mean, it sounds nice. You have a couple million you want to just throw around? The thing is, uh, what it requires a technician. We could, I mean, if you're going to get a million dollar instrument, you might as well also get a technician. Yeah. A nice image. I do, I do some good work sometimes. It's like a beach ball coming out of that diatom. <laughs> you could, uh, is this flat or does it have an angle, your stub? Or you can't, can you? you I don't want to tilt you it. You don't want to play with it? No. I'm going to go soon. So how's your uh, summer been so far? Good. Uh, this is Melissa, I think. I see your, uh, your pictures sometimes. You mean from my camera? Yeah. I do take pictures sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Where is it? Where is the sample from? This is from Mountain Lake, California. It's a good question. That's Kalanese I wanted, but it's broken. Uh, you know, there's something in this sample that might be new. It's not that. That just what caught me off guard. What do you see that's new? Mm, I found a Roycosphenia in the light microscope, but I haven't seen it yet. But I was zoomed way out looking at these giant things, so that's probably why. There's a Roycosphenia in here that might be a new. It's another. It looked very weird. Look at that little teeny guy. It's a baby sir. Uh, well, old man. You say this is a diverse assemblage in the lake? Yeah. Is it, huh? Yeah. It's got mostly benthic diatoms, so you want to see something cool? Yeah. yeah. Like a cool stride. It's Simbella Mexicana, and that, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, that's a Plaquenese. Is it? What is that? I think it's a Plaquenese. No photo? Yeah, I think it's a Plaquenese. Alcasiras. I can't even see any Melasiras except for that Oxyspore, which is kind of weird.
How long are you in town? Probably be here all of July. All of July? Yeah. Depressing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to be here all of July. <laughs> I'm not depressed by it. These guys here, Terpsino. What is that? It's a diatom. Really? Yeah, that's a diatom. Terpsino. What is it called? Trip? Terpsino. That's Terpsino Musica. <laughs> nice name. Yeah. Uh, in Girdle View, it looks like it has little musical notes in the light, mi in the light microscope. In SEM, it doesn't. It doesn't look at all like that in the SEM. That is a nominee again. You teaching a full load again this semester? Yeah, I have three classes. I think last last semester you were teaching five classes. Five, right? So calm down a little bit for you. Well, uh, unless somebody retires, I didn't really plan on teaching five. Sandy retired. Who's gonna teach your classes? I don't know. Not me. <laughs> That's all I care about, I guess. <laughs> Done doing that. We're a graduate student. Uh, Most likely I understand. Although she's probably going to teach it again from her house. I don't know. That's just one class, though. It was all the other ones that I taught of hers. How many graduate students do you have? Right now? Mm -hmm. um, well, Hung is probably going to be graduating in the fall oh, or okay. in the end of summer. Um, so technically four. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it'll be more like three next year, I think. I was going to look at the, the pictures that Coco Little for pictures I haven't seen. What is that? Uh, Alicacera granulata. Oh, very nice. These big long spines coming off of it. Do you have your own catalog? Uh, your pictures or no. do you just know I mean I I have all my pictures I don't make them into a catalog well I'm gonna have to come back and look for it again later I guess There is a way to to uh, to uh, transfer it from the light microscope to the SEM. If you see it on the light microscope. Oh, I'm sure they're here. I just trying to find one in a good view is the challenge. What are those small round things, small oval things? These ones? No. Yeah, yeah, like. Well, that's a diatom. It's Stephanodiscus. Minutulus? Something in that group. It's not quite Minutulus, though. That's a Stephanodiscus. Uh. These ones? Yeah. It's um, Starosyra. Not sure about the species. That's, they're the same as these ones um, here.
they're all laying on their sides. So this is a, from a core? No, it's lake, a or just sample from the surface water? sample. Someone sent it to you, or you have it where they're... Somebody sent it to me. It's a... Uh, from a very cleverly named place called Mountain Lake. Very original. Yeah. Can you guess? It's a lake in the mountains. Really? Never, I never would have. Boy, I mean, I came back and all the trees are gone in my neighborhood. What happened to them? A windstorm? You don't know about the huge storm that destroyed Farrington Grove? No. Seriously not? On June 19th? No. Uprooted like, I don't know, 10% of the trees or more. One of them came from across the street into my house. Did it hit your house? It's just short of it. Oh. It's a huge thing. Uh, we had a sign that destroyed that. It destroyed your sign? My wife has a sign there saying... What does the sign say? Ananda Wellness. Oh, Yoga oh, oh, Center. oh, it's a, oh, okay, like a business sign. But it destroyed that and a couple of other things. Uh, went on, oh, one of the, across from where Basan lives, mm -hmm. ex-Sandra. Good mm -hmm. news, everyone. She went on a house there and smashed it. Uh, you know, a huge amount of damage. Hmm. Were you here on that day? Uh, yeah, I was around. The 19th? You didn't notice it? No. Not where you live? I mean, there was a big storm. It must have hit uh, Farrington Grove really hard. There are at least three or four huge trees in the Fairbanks Park that disappeared. Uh, there was a big tree in, um, in Deming that I saw got like part of it got knocked down or ripped down. So You didn't suffer anything? No. I did see a big storm. I was probably taking pictures of lightning during it. But it wasn't particularly windy, at least not in my neighborhood. I was taking uh, yeah, pictures of the uh, fireworks yesterday. Yeah? Yeah, some nice photos. The ones here? Yeah. We should have a photo contest. I took some pictures of those fireworks. Uh, I'm not competing with you. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and who's going to who's going to uh, decide which is the better picture? Uh, she would be a good judge. Yeah, but that's that's because she doesn't care if I win or not. <laughs> um, Plus, we wouldn't tell her which one was which. Uh -huh. So it would just have to be... She, she would just have to know which one she liked better, and then... Were you there? Yeah, we went. The fireworks? Yeah. It was crazy. Couldn't yeah, the, breathe afterwards. Yeah, this uh, haze from the... Yeah. Yeah, I don't recommend you breathe that stuff. No. <laughs> and the, the uh, fire engine came. <laughs> yeah. I was out of there before that happened. I, I was, saw the fire engine come. Yeah, I was. They set something on fire? I don't know. I left too. Okay. We always, uh, for the fireworks, we always park like, um, not, out, quite, out in, not quite into your neighborhood, but like, you know, outside of the actual park because you can't get out of there afterwards. No, it was crazy. Yeah. But it was a, a nice fireworks show. Yeah. They do a good job. They do. Yeah, no doubt. How much doubt. do you think that cost? I, have I no estimated idea. like twenty thousand. I mean, slightly less than my neighbors apparently spent <laughs> on fireworks. Really? <laughs> you don't have fireworks in your neighborhood going off twenty four seven? Not, not as bad. Well, I don't have wind, but I have fireworks going off all the time. Did you buy some? No. Well, we had sparklers, but we didn't oh. buy them. Why would anyone buy fireworks? It's a good question. Probably because they like blowing things up. 
I mean, if the if the state if the city didn't have such nice uh, a nice display, maybe, but you can't compete with those. Well, those are professional, made in China. I think maybe you should lay that down as a challenge for people, and see if anybody picks it up. Because I feel like some of the people in my neighborhood might have tried to pick it up. They had fireworks going off like for two days in a row. Yeah, that's the uh, same. And I imagine it will also happen tonight. Okay. Do you like to watch the uh, Euro Cup? Uh, I don't watch sports that? very much. No? No. Is it any good? Uh, yeah, well, because I was in Europe. So. When were you in Europe? Just now. Just now? Mm -hmm. But please don't tell anybody. I won't tell anyone. Is everybody wondering where you are? No. Oh. I just... Well, if the FBI asks me, I'll tell them, but otherwise, no. Oh, what's this? A Unosha. What is that? It's a diatom. It's Unosha. Unosha? Yeah, Unosha. Usually found in swamps. Dystrophic environments. But there's only one of them, so it doesn't mean anything. Mountain Lake. Yeah. Is that north northern? California. Okay. Northern? Uh, near San Francisco. Oh. So how many mountain lakes are there in California? Must be a number of them. That's a good question. Uh, with a name that original, uh, it could be any number. I'm going to look it up. Mountain lake. Well, you could Google it and then tell me how many mountain lakes there are. It will be good to know. With and without the word California. We'll see how many other people come up with that exciting name. Mountain Lake, Virginia. West Virginia. A lake in Virginia. 4.5 stars. Oh. 4.5 <laughs> stars. Yeah. It's been reviewed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> By diatoms. Huh. Lake located in Gills County. Salt Pond. Oh. Smith Mountain Lake. There's also a city of Mountain Lake. Mountain Lake, Presidio, San Francisco. Is that you? Uh, probably. Mountain Lake is a living classroom in experiment in urban ecology. It's setting a precedent for the world. Did you know that? I did not. One of San Francisco's last surviving natural lakes. And the only natural lake in the entire 80,000 acre Golden State National Recreation. Uh, yeah. I agree. It's funny when people <laughs> rate nature. <laughs> I give, I give that mountain a three stars. Would be would be for the Matterhorn gets if four would, and a half. The, the Matterhorn The Matterhorn gets four and a half. Uh, everything is that, is, is that, that for that, real? Everything is reviewed these days. Everything. Is that for real? The Matterhorn has four and a half no, stars? Up, okay. I could look it up. I wanna know what is, what is do we consider which mountain would we consider five stars? 
it's important for me to know. Mount Fuji. Mount <laughs> Fuji gets five, huh? Nowadays, Mountain Lake is a feast for the senses. Oh, okay. Well, it's in a nice area. But there's a mountain lake in Oklahoma, too. Um, what? <laughs> mountain Lake, Oklahoma. <laughs> Four stars. <laughs> Four stars would be five yeah. if there were mountains. 4.1 stars. That's, I'm I, not joking. I get that. I just, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that, um, there's any mountains in Oklahoma. Is there? Arkansas, yes. Oklahoma? Springer, Oklahoma. That was a cool company I found. Okay. Ooh. These things? Yeah. They're all over the place. Mountain Lake in Gills County. A famous and mysterious lake that completely dried up years ago is coming back to life. Well, I could do lots of uh, you know, research on mountain lakes in the United States and the world. That sounds like a plan. If you want me to, I'll be your research assistant. Um, I can only pay you. No, no, free. In Oh, for free? Of course. Wait, you think I'm after money? I don't know what you're after. I don't either. <laughs> if I knew it, I, I would be much better off. Well, you're after knowledge, clearly, about mountain lakes. All the mountain lakes. It's a stuff in a discus. Nigeria. Picture this one and then I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to meet uh, Rick here tomorrow. See, speakers are still here. Have you seen him? Uh, you mean recently? No. I think it comes in twice a week. Right. You know if uh, if uh, Oswe completed his work? Um, no, I don't ask questions like that. When I see him, I just say hi. I feel like that's a question between him and his advisor. Well, that's true. I wouldn't ask. I wouldn't ask uh, your students either. So. <laughs> I feel like that's like uh, when you asked people, when are they going to graduate? I feel like you're, but, you know, you're setting yourself up. But the thing is that uh, he likes to talk, so maybe you get more information <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Well, I might. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to do from the SCM today. As soon as this picture is done, I'll get out of your way. I just want to look at the photos. Um, my, my hardest job, the hardest thing I find is organize, to organize everything. 
as you know, probably. That's, that's why I don't bother doing it. That's that goes from everything, like my coursework, you name it. Organization, my my, my references. One, the, uh, the, what is it, OnePlus, the, what is it called now, the uh, OneDrive? Yeah. Which is a disaster because it's never in sync. I don't know what to tell you about that. It would be so useful to have some tech guy in our department. Showing your the people what you're doing? Yeah, always. It's important for them to see what I'm doing. Excellent. It's all right. It's mostly clean from dirt. All right. Well, that's good. It's not easy taking firework pictures. Yesterday was too much haze. Thank you. 